My name's Mark Powell and I'm label manager of Esoteric Recordings, uh, Cherry Red Label. Uh, in July, uh, Esoteric will be releasing a box set, a four CD box set by Tony Banks called Accord Too Far. And I'm pleased to say that with me today on Cherry Red TV is Tony Banks. Tony, thanks very much for taking some time to have a chat. Very good. <laughs> and um, the emphasis, of course, on the box is about the Tony Banks as a solo artist or your, your material outside of Genesis. Um, and if I can take you all the way back to your very first solo album, a lot of people might be surprised that you've done quite a, quite a few um, albums under your own name because unfairly, they've, they've, some of them have fallen off the radar. Some, some would say very fairly. <laughs> yeah, it's a matter of, you know, it's the way it's been really. Yes, I have done. And one of the reasons for putting this out is definitely that, to, you know, people who've liked what Genesis have done and, you know, liked my contribution to that uh, may, may be quite interested, interested in some of these pieces because they didn't get a, a very great hearing first time around. I mean, the first two, A Curious Feeling and Fugitive, were sort of got a bit, but then it got less and less as the years went by. And in many ways, I think the music sort of possibly got better. I don't know. I think, yes, you, you covered a, a wide variety of, of, um, of, of music uh, over these albums. And uh, if I could take you back, back to the beginning, really, with A Curious Feeling. I mean, when did the idea of, of you first making a, a solo statement come to you? Um, well, I think, you know, you, every, everybody thinks about it at a certain point. And the, the first time I really thought about doing a solo album was when Peter Gabriel left Genesis and, um, and I got these pieces together. Um, but then it was a question of whether the group was going to carry on. We thought it probably was, but we had no real idea whether it was going to or not. And I'd written these pieces, which ended up obviously on Trick of the Tale. In fact, I'd written a lot of music that was on, ended up on that, particularly obviously Mad Man Moon and Trick of the Tale and Robbery Salt and Battery. But, you know, bits and pieces ended up all over the album. Um, but, you know, I probably wasn't ready for it then, so I was quite happy not to do it. Steve obviously did his solo album at that point. Um, but then later on, when Phil was having a bit of problems with his first marriage and he wanted a bit of space to try and sort it out, it was an obvious time for Mike and I to do it. So about 1978 this was. And, um, you know, I had this material. It was a pretty productive time for writing for me. I'd written a lot of stuff for Gen the Genesis albums prior to that, you know, Winter Mother and stuff. And I had a lot of material around as well. I started off with this idea that I'd written this piece for... Um, originally it was an introduction to the song Undertow, but I'd kind of... That we were then asked to do the Mike and I asked to do the music to the film The Shout, and I had this piece of music which I thought I sort of changed it around a bit and used one of the links as the main part because so it had a sort of slightly spooky sense to it, and I thought it turned out pretty well. So, kind of that was the sort of starting point for the for the solo album really, because it wasn't that well used in the film I don't think, and uh, you know and so the ideas developed from there and I just used everything I had around at the time and it was uh, it was a lot of fun really. I could just you know I didn't. It was just like an extended version of some of the Genesis things I'd done. It's sort of a bit like One for the Vine, you know, it's kind of like taking that idea, but extended it over a whole album. And um, feeling there was no... Uh, I didn't have any kind of barriers. I didn't have to have a single. So in those days, you didn't think you had to have a single anyhow. But it was difficult to get noticed, I suppose, without the single. But, um, you know, you got a bit of attention at the time. But, you know, it didn't do... I hoped for slightly more than it did, I suppose. <laughs> like you always do. Because the... the the concept of a curious feeling was 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 based on on the book um, Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes. I mean, did you set out to write a conceptual thing with that? Originally, novel? that was the idea. I wanted to write a concept album based on that book, and I was much more literally based on the book. But when I was um, writing this thing, and I asked permission, to Daniel Keyes' permission, he he was fine about it. But he said, "You must realise there is a musical coming out in London, starring Michael Crawford, based on the book." And um, and I thought, you just didn't know really whether the, the, it was going to suddenly be like Jesus Christ Superstar or whatever. So you thought it might be a bit strange. So I was encouraged to, to change the story. So I adapted some of the story so that it became a slightly different emphasis. But, you know, the, the sort of general feel is the same in the sense of what happens to this character. But it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful little story, Flowers for Algernon, I think. And uh, this isn't, you know, my story is not as good but it has it has the same emotive quality I think about it as it turned out the music was a flop um, I mean to say it, it wasn't that bad actually but um, so I wouldn't have made any difference I could have put it out with the original thing you know but anyhow that was history but it would have been quite nice to have done it with that idea I think because it was a, a very strong little story 
Where did you find um, Kim Beacon as, as a vocalist? Well, I just I listened to loads and loads of tapes that were sent to me by various people, um, and Kim was one of them who sent to me. Obviously, he was on. He worked with this group, String Driven Thing, that uh, Charisma were involved with, but I didn't actually know that at the time. I just had this stuff, and I liked his voice. I thought it could work, and um, you know, and I sent him uh, demos of everything with me singing, <laughs> which is pretty weird. And he he came back and he sang, you know, and I thought he had a good voice for it. In fact, you know, he he was sort of it's quite a sort of um, because he's sort of he obviously he's no longer with us, you know. He's, he's sort of very much in my mind. He's become the character in the story, you know, which is kind of weird in a way. Uh, and I think, but I think his voice was he had a lovely voice and and it suited most of the songs pretty well, you know. And he certainly did, he was very enthusiastic and did a great job of me. You recorded the album in, in Stockholm um, at yeah. Polar Studios. Was there a particular reason for, for doing it then? It's just really good to be away from everything else. You've got no distractions. You know, back in those days, mobile phones didn't exist, so it was an expensive phone call, so people didn't tend to phone up, so you weren't disturbed quite as much and everything. And it just sort of was a chance for us all just to be together and do it. Unfortunately, of course, my, Dave Henschel got um, mumps and didn't come for the first week. So I ended up, along with the engineer Dave Bascom, who obviously later became you know, quite a well-known uh, producer, but it was his, he was a tape op, you know, it was one of his first sessions, and he was with me, so we had no real idea what we were doing, but we had to do put down the basic tracks, so most of the tracks we put down um, ourselves. So it actually sounded pretty good, I think we were quite impressed. I, I was going to say as well, because on, on the album you play basically all the instruments apart, apart from drums. Yeah, well the reason for that really many ways was well, I wanted I wanted to do it for a start. I've always pl I played a certain amount of guitar with Genesis over the years, you know, particularly on the rhythm guitar. And I just wanted to try it, I suppose. I thought, well, I can do this. And also, I, I'm not very good at delegating. I quite like this. I don't really want anyone else to do it, you know. One of those people who quite likes to do it all if I can. Um, but, you know, so I couldn't drum. And, and so I asked Chester, you know, obviously at the time, he was drumming with Genesis and we got on very well and he sort of liked things I'd done. So. Um, that worked out well. And uh, playing lead guitar and bass guitar was actually pretty difficult. I found <laughs> it is, you know, just because it's you know, the lead guitar. In fact, that I play on that, it sounds like a synthesizer anyhow. It wasn't really way worth the time. But I was very happy picking guitar, and I wrote a lot of the songs on guitar. You know, things like Lucky Me in particular, and, and Curious Feeling itself. You know, which I wrote on guitar. So it was natural for me to play them like that. So I, I, it was a nice chance to do that, I suppose. Um, Obviously, I'd written quite a lot of good things with Genesis on guitar. I mean, I mentioned many times things like the opening part of Supper's Ready and and various bits and pieces in Musical Box and stuff like that. So, kind of, um, it was, uh, you know, nice to do, nice to follow it right the way through rather than sort of feeling I had to get on the keyboards all the time. Did you, um, when you when you did that album, I mean, was it was it uh, very much an intention that this a solo thing would be always be the sideline to? to your activity with Genesis, there was never a thought of Well, I think it was a question of, it, it ended up being the sideline. Um, I mean, obviously with Phil, you know, it became probably <laughs> the major thing, or at least it was certainly on, in parallel. I think it's just how well these things do, you know. I, I, in terms of my composition and what I emphasis, effort I put into it, it was just as great. Um, I've said many times, it takes just as much effort to write a, a Miss album as it does to write a hit album, you know. Um, and it gave me a chance to work with lots of other people. I really enjoyed doing it. Every time I made these, I loved making the albums. I loved writing them, loved making them. And I say releasing them was, was not the most fun necessarily, but kind of, you know, I accepted it a bit really for what I did. I know that within Genesis itself, I was kind of the one who perhaps drew it back from being a sort of, you know, perhaps even bigger commercial success, you know, because I like to put in those chords, you know, hence the title, the chord too far and all that. Um, and so on my, when I left my own devices, I put them in all the time, you know, which of course alienates half your audience. The, uh, the other half quite likes it, but the, you know, there are people who do find it difficult to hear certain changes and things. And, um, and I love doing that. So, you know, I knew, I knew a little bit what I was, I was playing all the time with on, on the edge there a bit. So uh, taking you on a, a, a few years to, to the next album, The Fugitive, um, on that one, you took the step of actually singing yeah. all the songs yourself. Well, I found with a curious feeling that everyone had sort of said, you know, there was a slight um, identity problem with it, you know, and that because you know people thought well, you sing, you know, you must have sung it, you know. And I just said no, I didn't sing it, I got the kind. Because it was less, it perhaps happens more now than it used to. I think that um, I, you know, I wanted to, I didn't mind the idea of singing. I mean, I, I kind of sung on demos and things, you know. I knew I hadn't got a great voice, but it, something about doing it. I thought I ought to do it one time and see what would happen really. 
um, you know, as I committed myself, it's a bit like so when you're diving into a swimming pool, you sort of, once you left the side, you know you've got to go in, you know. And once I'd said I was going to do it, I had to do it, and I, because I, I wasn't really sure whether I really could do it or not. But I um, did it here, and, um, you know, you certainly just found a way you have to do it, and a sort of trying to sing, sing it, rather than just sort of let it happen, you know. I mean, I have voice, I've got a reasonably pure voice that's all right, but you had to try and give it a bit of personality. And that, that sort of was the thing to try and do, I suppose. And it just, it's, it was an interesting experience. I had to simplify some of the melodies a bit and certainly lyrics I kept a bit simpler. Just tried to hold, make the whole thing a little bit more sort of contained. You know, it was when I was writing for sort of Phil or Peter, I would didn't care what I gave him, you know. <laughs> you sing it, you can do that, you know. Um, whereas myself, I found I couldn't, so I had to sort of slightly change it and things. But I think, you know, some of the songs sound okay. And I think when you hear the vocal now, it's, it's obviously not a great voice, but it, I think it's okay. I think it stands up and the songs that I'm singing, you know, have a certain charm about them because they are me singing my own songs, you know, and I think that's quite nice. And um, you know, I quite, I, I see this interesting experience. But on that, obviously, I decided to, you know, to use guitarists and, and drummers and everything on that rather than just doing it all myself. And, and obviously, by that time, we were working with Daryl Sturmer with the group and he was a very natural person for me to, to use. I just think he's a, you know, he's such a versatile player, a really, really good player. So I kind of, you know, had him on right from the word go and then just sort of the rest, worked the rest of the people around it, right? Did you, uh, around that time, were you, were you sort of working initially in the, in the studio here or did you demo, demo elsewhere? I did everything at home. Yes. Was demoed. I mean, all these songs started off as demos. In fact, in most of the songs, what you're hearing on is, is includes parts that were that on the demo. So we added to them, really. So I did them all with a drum machine. I already did one, one, of, one of these drum machines, actually, oh, which, right. is, which, of course, then um, later on, Phil used with great effect on uh, things like In the Air Tonight and stuff. And obviously, we used it on Genesis albums as well. But I, for some reason, I cut out all the drum machines, because some of them were quite good little parts, actually. But that was my decision at the time, was to get rid of that and replace it all with real drums which I did with various different drummers. Um, yeah, it was, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, home, doing yes. them at home on the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the demos. Yeah, and I, I like to sort of work it out. I quite like working from demos because you've sort of done, you've got the essence of the song is down um, and a lot of the keyboard parts and stuff were down there and you bring it in here and you add to it. It sort of seems to be quite a good way of doing it. I mean, there were one or two songs I did do totally in the studio, things like, uh, I remember doing, uh, actually on that particular album, I might have done all of them from the studio, actually, it was certainly some of the ones with Curious Feeling I, I did from, um, I did do, in fact, a Curious Feeling was the one I did with that one. Fugitive, I used, was using a Lindrum machine by that time, and some of that stuff did end up on the albums as it happens, but, uh, you know, it's a mixture of the two, and with Genesis, we've often mixed the two, and it's a, it's a, it, it just ties the thing down. It's quite a nice thing to do. It sometimes restricts you a little bit in a bad way, but it also restricts you in a good way, I think. It means you, you know, it keeps me in time for a start. It's not bad. <laughs> do you, um, did you find that uh, it was, it, it was a different sort of mindset to sort of working, um, uh, taking things from demos and then sort of, and then bringing other musicians at a later stage, perhaps on? on well, it's easier to be, you can sort of, produce it if you like because you can be in here while people are adding parts to what you've done which I think is quite a good thing to do particularly when assessing drummers you know because I went through a few drummers on, on it actually and I you know the, the first drummer I had was, was was really good for certain things but you really couldn't do some of the other things so then I got in a second guy in um, actually first of all actually the, um, the guys working with Steve Short having had sight problems with the first drummer, he said, you know, well, what drummer in the world would you most like to work with? And I said, well, Steve Gadd, I said. So he said, okay, I'll give him a call. <laughs> and he gave him a call, and he had me coming over to work with Ringo, apparently, for a couple of days. And he came here. He hadn't slept, I don't think, for a week when he came here. He was, he was, he looked absolutely grey and everything. But anyhow, he played on three of the tracks on the album, and that was, was a great thrill for me to have him on there, because he was a wonderful drummer. I mean, I didn't give him anything very much to do, you know what I mean? But what he did was, was very tasteful and very nice. And obviously he couldn't stay after that. So after that, I got this other drummer, Tony Bearden, who was a really excellent drummer, mm. I think, actually, who, um, you know, he played on everything else. And that was really great. So I, I was, you know, musicianship on the album, I think it's really good. I think that, um, you know, Daryl was, was brilliant throughout, I think, and the drumming, as I said, works very well. Mo Foster on bass. And me singing, so that's the only weak link, if you like. <laughs> the album was, was more dare I say it's sort of 
more direct and, and shorter and, and perhaps more commercial in its, its approach. Was that a, d a deliberate? Well, it certainly was more direct, mainly because of the singing as much as anything else. But I mean, you know, my own feelings about things have changed a little bit. You know, we, we get to the stage where with Genesis and stuff, you know, where we kind of people always think it's a sort of rather kind of calculated thing, but it wasn't really. We kind of did a certain kind of music and you got to a certain point, you felt you were repeating yourself and the things you couldn't do again. And, and I came into this business listening to people like the Beatles, obviously, you know, and all those groups in the 60s, Kinks and Zombies, anybody. And so I, I always like the sort of shorter form, if you can do it, do it, you know. But I like I like a bit of both, really. I want to do some slightly more uh, slightly more ambitious things as well. But with The Fugitive, I did try and keep stuff a little bit shorter um, and, and singable, I suppose. Um, I don't know that I really thought in sort of commercial terms. I just sort of did did what I did, I think. And um, I mean, it didn't end up being very commercial, let's be honest about it. But it, it was it did have some shorter things. And I think, you know, perhaps... There was one song that did get played quite a bit on the radio, actually, which was The Wheels Keep Turning. I did an edit of that when there was one one of the Radio 1 DJs was actually quite keen on it. used to play it quite a bit, but it didn't really get anywhere after that. So, But, you know, the album did OK. At that point, did, did you find it frustrating that, that um, well, and, and beyond that, that uh, people saw you as a member of Genesis and, and didn't sort of look at your sort of work in the same way they may have looked at Phil's or Mike's? Well, not really. I think, with the, you know, I felt I was a member. That was what I was really. And then these, you know, I was very happy to have the Genesis thing. I mean, it allowed me to make all these records. I mean, if without Genesis, I wouldn't have probably done anything like this. Um, I would, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to so it's a toss up here. I mean, you know, kind of, I, I'm very happy with the way the career's gone and everything. I can't d deny that. In sense, obviously, one would have liked a little more success on the solo front, you know. And particularly once, you know, the, the, the massive success of, of, of Phil and then later, obviously, with Michael and Michael Mechanics and stuff. It would be nice to have been part of that, I think, really, because... But, you know, that's that's the way these, these things go, really. And I don't think the music is... You know, the music I wrote for these records is, is no... I don't think it's inferior for the stuff I wrote for Genesis. And some of those Genesis pieces are, like, had massive audience, and that's fantastic, you know. It's just... It's very difficult to promote a record. Even... Even a group like us, we would t tend to be promoted with singles, which was curious because even whatever anyone says about the way we were, but if you go through to things like Duke, Abercab and all those, they're still quite progressive albums mm. in a way, you know. And the singles, if they hadn't hit singles, they wouldn't have sold. That's how it was, you know, no one knows about them. Even more so, though, with with the solo thing, if you because no one even... You, you've got to have something out. And when Mike obviously had a hit with um, Silent Running, that kind of put him on the map, really. And that's that's what you need. You get your foot in the door, and then you then you make the most of it. I think really. Uh, unfortunately, I never had that foot in the door. I've came close to it many times. I think you know. I want to change the score with Nick Kershaw's one, which again might have done it, but it's just one of those things. And of course, at the same time as that, you you were involved in film soundtracks, mm. and um, the album that followed the Fugitive was The Wicked Lady, which was a, a, a soundtrack of the film uh, directed by Michael Winner. Uh, how did you get involved with with that project initially? I, I was recommended to Michael by a guy who worked at Atlantic, actually, Phil Carson. Um, and my, Michael was interested in me. I was cheap, which is good, you know, and <laughs> different. He always liked sort of, um, you know, he liked working with different people. I mean, I, whether that was because no one would work with him twice, I don't know. But he was, I mean, I got on well with him, actually. And uh, it was it was fun to do that. But I was doing, at the same time I was doing The Fugitive, I was doing mm. the two things actually together. And I was just, had too much going on, really. So what I used to do was I, I had the made this theme I'd written, which I originally thought of including on the fugitive, but decided I wouldn't. Um, and I played it to Michael, and he he really loved it and everything. And then, you know, he suggested obviously I worked with an arranger and stuff. And so what I ended up doing was I I recorded about four or five pieces, um, just as a sort of like a sort of, so I had some things to go back to all the time for the different characters and stuff, and use them. And then. Um, when doing the, the the incidental music, I would kind of play it on a piano, and and give it to the arranger, with reference to the things that we'd done, and then he'd make sense of it. And um, you know, once or twice, when he had some things, he had to do some of the cues himself because I, I didn't have time to do everything. But it it worked worked really well, I think, at times. I mean, the main theme sounds does sound really good with an orchestra, and that which is what made me led me later on to think about doing orchestral albums. So I just thought. This piece that had sounded, you know, nice on the piano, but not particularly special, sounded really good on the, um, with an orchestra. It was just unfortunate the film was um, not, not a great film, but it mildly, I suppose, had a fantastic cast, and it was it wasn't as bad as all that, but it wasn't very good. 
Uh, so he didn't really do much. He didn't sort of give me a career to go to, if you like. Um, so each time, and it, it, you're so dependent on the film. You can do all this work, and I mean, you know, later on I did work on other films that you know, took up a lot of time. The film comes out, or even before it comes out, everyone says this is a complete flop, you know, and then that's it, really, isn't it? So it's a. I've done you know, say three or four of them, but I'm not. It's not something I kind of. I love the way music works with film, but I'm not sure it's really for me. Because, uh, as as you say, you mentioned the other other film um, projects, um, mm. which uh, much of that came out on the the album soundtracks, mm. which, as an album, I think actually st stands really nicely as an album. If it mm. if it wasn't uh, if you didn't know it was a film uh, soundtrack mm. record, I think it would it, it works anyway. Um, yeah, well, I, I wrote. Yes, I'd originally been asked to do the music to the film 2010, the follow-up to 2001, and uh, I wrote this piece, and I wrote some other pieces, because I thought, you know, in case he didn't like the first piece, he, and I played it to the director, Peter Himes, and, uh, and his producer and people, and the producer loved it, but the director, he didn't like it at all, which, and uh, I thought it was a really good piece of music, and we worked great for 2010. Obviously, we'd orchestrated, mm. it would have been a different kind of thing, you know. Anyhow, I was thrown off that project, so this other project came up, which was another science fiction film called, well, it was called, went through various titles, but I think it ended up being called Starship, I don't know, Lawker and the Outlaws, which was a truly terrible film, to be honest, I have to be honest, the final result of that. Anyhow, I used this theme in there, just play, me playing on a piano and a synthesizer, and, and it sounded, sounded nice, you know, I thought it was great. So that's where that ended up, and I wrote other music for that film. I um, also did a couple of songs for that. Uh, thing. One was uh, a sort of supposed to be the title track which you call this victory with Jim Diamond but then also I had this other slot they wanted a piece of music and I had this other song around a big thing which I thought obviously they weren't going to use this totally in the thing but they might use some of it so um, I really wanted to do it and I, I very fancied the idea of working with someone a bit different and, and female voice was, was seemed like a natural thing to try and do something different so we got in touch with Toya and she was very enthusiastic about it actually which was just great I played the piece she really liked the piece and she wrote a lyric, a complete lyric for it. And then I said, that's great, it's fantastic. And then a few days later, she said, I don't like that lyric. And she wrote a completely new lyric for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I like that too, that's great. You know, we came in here and did it. And um, it was great fun working with her because I'd never worked with a female voice before. And it was a very different experience, you know. And she, I think it was quite a good thing for her too because, she, you know, her music tended to be, you know, she hadn't really used the full range of her voice, I don't think, before, and this gave her a chance, so I said, just do whatever, and took to the end, I tried to get her to sort of yell and do all that sort of stuff. And in the middle, she has a very soft voice, so I think it's a really good track. It's one of my favourite tracks I've ever done, actually. I think it just really works well, and uh, and she sings it really well. And uh, so the, rest of the, the rest of the album, well, there was the, there's the, the, the film Quicksilver, which is another mm. film. I'm afraid Kevin Bacon's made a lot of good films, but unfortunately this wasn't one of them. <laughs> There's a bit of a sort of a, a bit of a kind of a thing going on here, isn't there? Um, but, uh, you know, it wasn't that bad in, when I saw the rushes and stuff. I didn't think it was too bad. But anyhow, I, I wrote some music for it, and uh, I wrote what I thought would be a really good main theme for it. But the guy, I mean, oh, they liked the music I'd written, but they, the guy just wanted to use songs, really. You know, one of those films where they used about a dozen songs. And so you know the music was one of those ones where you don't really notice it, the music sort of in there you know and the, i wrote this very nice theme i thought um but it didn't get much use so i've actually opening this this soundtracks uh this called too far with with this little piece i wrote so it's this nice little theme and it sort of sets the whole thing up quite well i think to give it a bit more emphasis than it had on the on the thing i also did a uh, one of the songs for the film um was this song Shortcut to Somewhere I did with Fish. The idea of working with Fish was always was, you know, quite a fun idea at the time. Beryllium were kind of often compared to Genesis and and I met Fish and we got on really well and did this piece. It was a little bit wordy actually. I think you should have we tried to sort of cut a few words out here and there, but <laughs> he insisted to get to get all this meaning out there. Anyhow we did the thing and it was supposed to be in a certain point in the film and the guy didn't want to use it in that point in the film, so it didn't actually occur in the film, but it is on the soundtrack. Mm. So, you know, after this, I was must have got a bit disillusioned with doing film soundtracks, and so that was kind of the last one I did. I thought, well, I just don't know, really want to do this. You know, it's, 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 you're so at the whim of the director, you know, you can do something good. I mean, the best one I did really was The Wicked Lady, just because he, you know, Michael used everything I gave him, really, and it was also very enthusiastic. So, you know, so then you have, then you end up with putting these two film soundtracks plus the music, uh, the two, the three songs on this. 
Um, and as you say, I think it works works quite well. There's two or three instrumental pieces that really do stand up on their own. I think which are some of which are on this compilation, plus the three vocal tracks. And then it was it was another three years uh, before you emerged with another uh, solo project. Mm. Under well, I think the we did had we had presumably Invisible Touch in the middle of. That's August, right, which yeah. was obviously you you took were, up a lot of time, a, yeah. a lot of time. Uh, and then you uh, released it under the name Bank Statement. Mm. Um, why, why did you decide to do that? Well, it's a sort of slightly banks? parallel thing to Mike, what Mike did, I suppose. We went through the same thing. We sort of went through the same experiences. It was a bit like initially you put out with your name, but you're not singing, and they say, oh, what's going on? Then you think, okay, well, I'll sing the next one. You sing the next one. It doesn't do very well. So you think, what's the next thing? The next thing is try and have a group name, you know, to, to, let, to hang on to it, really. And obviously, you went for Mike and the Mechanics, and the rest is history, as it were. I went for Bank Statement, and that's a more of a different historical document, really. I, I just. I just thought try and take the emphasis off me. I, I never really, I'm, I'm not very comfortable being the, the focus of attention. I much prefer to have somebody else. I had two, you know, really good singers on the album. I thought that would be really nice to sort of just to change it so that the singers became, perhaps became more prominent than me in a way, you know, which didn't really happen, but that was the idea. And um, again, I mean, it was nice for me that record to work again with another girl singer, Janie Klimek, um, who was actually Steve Hillage, who was the producer on that album. He, he, he found her, and uh, Alistair Gordon, who who's a singer again, found through tapes and demos and stuff, and I thought really liked his voice. So you know that was uh, it was quite you know it was a what can I say it was just another experience working with a load of different people, Jeff Dugmore drums and stuff, uh, again with with uh, this time because Steve was uh, Steve Hillard was a guitarist, I didn't actually use Daryl on this one, but to get Steve to play guitar was actually quite difficult. <laughs> he had a bit of a thing about it. He sort of thought, oh, you know. And when he did, he would sort of, he'd hover over the guitar. Oh. <clears throat> he'd play one note. <laughs> Steve played two notes, you know. Um, but there are a couple of moments when you just let fly slightly. Mm. The end of the mm. song Queen of Darkness, I think, which where he's, he's, he's just, it's a great groove going there. It's really good. And little, little, little licks here and there, which he did. But um, means the guitar is slightly unre underrepresented on that album, I think. Um, there's a few little moments where the bass comes out, Pina Ballad, you know, you know like on. Um, I'll be waiting. I think where he sort of does a little little lick, which is really nice, and things like that. So, but apart from that, I think it's um, you know some again some variety of songs, some some good, some less good. Hopefully, the good ones are on this. And um, and then working with Steve, which was which was a lot of fun. He was <laughs> he's a, he's a certain kind of character. I don't know if you've come across Steve Hillich. Yes, <laughs> sort of yes. chap, you know, and yeah. trying to sort of sometimes you can't speed him up. And if he thinks things are not quite in time, he's going to spend quite a lot of time proving to himself that it either is or isn't. <laughs> so uh, those, you had a few moments where it sort of got slightly bogged down and things like that. But yeah, we got on well, and it was you know I, I thought the album was really good, but uh, you know Virgin thought it was really good too, actually. I, I think it's one of the one of the one of the ones that sort of stands up amongst your solo records. I think is, is, is being. Well, you're going to say that about all of them. Well, all, but <laughs> that one. In, I, think I don't know. Really, I just I, I I I gave up. At this point, it was. You know, you just you felt I had a couple of covers. Again, I don't think I really had the hit single. You see, that's the point. You've got to have that song that kind of comes out and makes people listen to it. I don't think it was it wasn't really one on this album. I think the the combination of you working with with someone like Steve Hillage on there, which is sort of quite a, it's an interesting dynamic that you can actually hear on the on the music on the album. Actually, mm, it's slightly well, different. It's, sort of yeah, different. It's different. Range, yeah. I mean, it was his idea actually to do the Queen of Darkness thing, which because that was obviously it was a piece that was on soundtracks album just an instrumental piece and he said that piece is really good you should try and make a song out of it so I said okay you know and uh, I didn't actually want to use the middle eight because I thought it was changed the key change was a bit odd and everything but he wanted that bit in too so I said okay well, let's do that and so I did the whole thing like that and I think it's, you know I think Janie sings it really well so it's, it comes a pretty positive track and uh, the album you followed that with still I think is is another one that uh, that many fans and um, myself as well included I think think it is another sort of Highlight with some some really interesting material on it, um, and you work with a wide variety of vocalists on on that album. Well, too. I did, yes, um, with Janie again, and well, I, I I'd really like I'd always like Nick Kershaw as a sort of guy. I think he just writes really good pop songs, you know. And I I'd, re I'd really like the Works album, and and he'd said I talked to him about it. He said that you know each of his albums have kind of sold less than its predecessor, and the Works didn't do very well, but it's got some fantastic tracks on it. I took a track called Cowboys and Indians, which I thought was fantastic, and I really like the drumming on that too. Uh, and I sort of looked to who that was, and that was Vinnie Coluto. And uh, so I kind of, kind of hard on both. You know, I rang Nick Carvin and said, do you, do you want to do it? And, you know, and he said, yeah, that'd be great. 
and um, so obviously and there was also the possibility I worked with uh, fish again on that you know having enjoyed the experience before so it was uh, you know I thought I thought I'm not going to try a group I'm not going to try anything I thought this is I haven't tried this <laughs> I'm just going to use what singer I think is right for a particular track you know and I thought this you know certain things when I wrote Red Down Blue Star, I really thought this this would suit Nick's voice you know and, and he wrote the lyric for that and and that worked really well, you know, and so you kind of use a bit horses for courses, you know, and uh, again, having the girl singer to be able to sing something, you know, Water Out of Wine, which it is on that album, Water Out of Wine, I think it is on. It is, yes. The next album. No, it's <laughs> um, was, is a song, you know, is one of my, is, that is another of my favourite songs, really, and I think she sings that beautifully, you know, so it's, you, just, the, you can have more choice, really. If you've got one singer throughout, you know, even back in the days of Genesis, were some songs where you felt, well, you know, the, the singer would perhaps not, the singer you would have chosen if you could have chosen any singer, you know. Sometimes he was, I mean, fantastic voices, obviously, but you know, you just need different people sometimes. So it was great, great to do that, really, and ended up with a album. I was very satisfied with that album when I finished. I thought this, you know, all round, I thought this was really good. And it was the first time I worked with uh, Nick Davis, you know, and he obviously he's been a collaborator ever since then, and we got on really well. And, uh, you know, he's very enthusiastic and good ideas and stuff. So it kind of, um, I did have high, slightly high hopes for that album. Also, I thought with Nick on board and we did the song, I Want to Change the Score, which I thought was a good pop song, you know. But again, you just, if you don't get played, you don't get played, do you, you know. And uh, so it didn't happen that really, but uh, I think it's, I think it's got some good stuff on it, definitely. So is that why, um, following that, uh, with, with Strictly Inc, you actually chose a, a, a totally different identity, really, for, for, mm. for your next project uh, well I wanted to go I like the idea of just working one person again I thought it would be quite a nice thing to do and um, you know Jack Hughes was someone actually that, that Nick Davis had worked with and you know and I heard his voice I really liked his voice and met him we got on really well and you know he was he thought the idea would be fun to do the, to do a whole album together like that so it became slightly more of a sort of duo type thing I so I wanted to sort of feel like that but he yeah I mean I, I liked his voice because his voice, as I think I've said it before, but his voice is a bit like mine, but but good, <laughs> in a way. And so I liked to hear it was occasionally a slightly manic quality would come into his voice. I really quite liked, but he could also sing very nice softly and things. Um, he was also a guitarist, so he played some, the, most of the guitar on the album. There's a couple of moments when I got in Daryl, for there's a big solo on the, on the long track, Island in the Darkness, which I wanted that sort of that kind of playing, which wasn't really what Jack could do. Um, yeah, it was, I don't know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, in a way, the, the writing on Still and Strictly Inc. was sort of somewhat similar, the way I approached it and everything. But I, I did have, have this idea that with Strictly I'd really like to just try doing what you might call a more old-fashioned prog rock track, you know, make it long, make, don't worry about anything, repetition, do any highs, lows and all the rest of it. and. Uh, Island in the Darkness is what it became, and it's about 15 minutes long, so it's you know, quite long. And you know, and I think it, I mean, I was very pleased with it when it turned. I thought it sounded really good, so I was happy with that. Um, and so the other track I mentioned on this album, which is worth mentioning, is this track "Charity Balls," that I wrote about people with secrets, something in their past, a dark secret in their past that was going to come out at some point. Um, at the time, I think it was sort of was a lot of exposure of sort of. Uh, cash for questions, you know, with Tory MPs, but there's always an undercurrent of sex and stuff as well, you know. So, um, I didn't realise I was writing about people like, you know, Jimmy Savile and, and Rolf Harrison Wilson, because obviously I didn't know who these people were, but there were people. And this idea somehow of, of the hypocrisy of, of, you know, going to charity, doing all this charity work, but having this dark secret that you must all the time feel is going mm. to come out, you know. And if it's Jimmy Savile, he didn't mind he sort of pretty much said he was doing half these things. That's what's extraordinary about it. But a lot of people obviously knew about it. And uh, and obviously in the end, he, he got away with it. But um, some of the others haven't got away with it. I mean, I don't know, you know. So it's become, become a bit hysterical recently about who get who gets done and who doesn't. But on the other hand, so it's all about people with dark secrets and uh, done in a humorous way, I hope, with a very lightweight kind of... Um, musically a very lightweight track, but I think it sort of works pretty well. I remember the finish the album that Jack said that was his favourite track, so, you know, I don't know. It's, it, it works on its own level, it works well, I think. Yes. 
but with that record it, it, you, you you mentioned i think with an island in the darkness mm -hmm. you know that was something that stood out to me i think at the time when it came out because it was uh it was something that it was a return as you say to a form that you hadn't explored for for, for well, a right. while right it was i had this little theme that i actually wrote i think when we were improvising um during the previous genesis album and i i thought it's really good you know and i thought it doesn't wasn't really working in the bit we we're using it on so i thought i'll just get it in the back of my mind so when i came back to it I thought, and i used that as a sort of theme and i suppose i did the same trick as i'd done on um for the fifth of using it quiet and then very loud you know and it and it sort of seemed to work in both those formats very well so that was sort of a starting point I had those things and the rest of the song i had the a lot of the piano on it was sort of like just arranged improvisations actually there's a whole bit quiet bit which doesn't sort of repeat just goes on and on and on which was just pretty much just something i'd played and i just learnt it <laughs> and then played it again um to tidy it up slightly you know and that was quite fun to do really i, I like well as you know there's a thing that I like doing and some people like to hear from me and other people perhaps find a little irritating but I, you know the lack of repetition sometimes I do like that you just sort of do a thing once and even if it's good you think you know just you pass on and go on to the next bit and that can work I think so sorry I'm moving across here I'll move back again shall I? I'll move anywhere you like <laughs> um, no it's uh, so it was it was fun to do I, re I did really enjoy doing that and it was, it was playing a different slightly different kind of way to I'd played on you know, on some of the previous albums, really, but trying to be more compact, I decided I wasn't going to be compact anymore. I'd just go for it. But I mean, I think there's lots of other good tracks in that album, actually. I, know, I don't know, whereas you, you mentioned sort of things like Still and Curious Feeling, which perhaps go down quite well with people who know what I do. I feel Strictly probably doesn't go down quite so well, but I kind of, um, I'd like to, on this album, by having rearranging the tracks and putting them slightly different, hopefully slightly change people's opinion on that. I think it's an album that, uh, revisited i think stands up amongst anything else you've done actually and, and i yeah, think well, i certainly don't i don't feel it's weak you know whereas if you look at the genesis canon i might sort of look at things like calling all stations not being quite as good as the others you know but i don't really don't feel with my own stuff i sort of feel that that that's as good as any of the other albums so it's um it's you know it's just how you in your once my opinion isn't really of much relevance you know it's the so-called subjective opinion you know it's other you know you just but I do feel so few people have heard some of this music and the people who are most likely to like it are people who've liked Genesis in the past, particularly perhaps the early Genesis, but, you know, all Genesis of any kind, really. And, and t talking of audiences, I mean, you, uh, after that, you moved into a, into a, a different world of, of classical music mm. um, with um, Seven. Mm. How did the Seven Project um, come to being? Well, after I'd done the Strictly In thing, and I, as I said, really, it didn't seem to just couldn't get any, generate any interest at all with that. I, I thought, I don't think I want to do another rock album. And I just thought, you know, after the uh, um, Calling All Stations thing, which again hadn't perhaps, you know, set the world on fire, I thought, you know, perhaps I should retire. And I thought, but before I retire, one thing I'd really like to do is, is do an orchestral album, because I'd really loved the way that um, the Wicked Lady had sounded, and I thought I could do that. Um, I'd got a few pieces around, one or two I'd had around for a long time, and one or two I'd written with not really quite knowing what I was going to do with them, but I hadn't really planned. Um, one of them was ended up as a piece called, ended up being called Spring Tide, which is on this album, the demo I did, which I did at home, when I had no particular thoughts that this was going to be orchestral. I didn't quite know what I wanted it to be, but I wanted to put it down, so I had it. And so the version you've got there is not like the orchestral version, really. It's quite piano-based, but it has a certain quality about it, I think. Um, so I I was getting, you know, writing stuff. And then I, when I wrote a piece, the piece called Black Down, which is on this album, the second I wrote just using a string synthesis, I thought this would sound fantastic with a real orchestra. You know, I really want to do that. So that was the one that made me feel I've really got to try and get this together because it's got a lot of hurdles to get over here, you know, plus all the fact that, you know, one's general kind of inferiority complex when it comes to the orchestral word, classical musicians and all the rest of it, you know. And that made me feel it's really worth doing. I must do this. So I did it, put together about six or six or seven tracks, which I thought, you know, would all work orchestrally. And then I got in touch with this, uh, again, through Nick Davis, I got in touch with this uh, arranger guy called Simon Hale, who'd done a certain amount, of, used to arrange a certain amount for, you know, for rock people, as well as doing classical stuff as well and everything. So someone understood everything. And, and we got on really well. And 
he did you know he did the job on this which is really good i think and then it was a matter of trying to find a recording do the recording and that was the most difficult thing because simon didn't conduct so we we got a conductor in i went into abbey road studios and recorded four of the three or four of the pieces and they just sounded awful <laughs> i just sounded so weak you know they didn't have any of the quality about it and i thought this isn't working, you know, and it costs a lot of money to do this. And I think, oh, what do I do? And I said, oh, well, so I just decided to leave it with the thought that I might not go back to it or I might go back to it. Anyhow, later on, talked to Nick, you know, got Nick more involved in everything. And um, and then we got in touch with this, you know, different set of people. We got Mike Dixon, who is a, someone again who straddles the world of pop, and he, he was MD on the um, We Will Rock You show for a long time and stuff. And so he understood both sides a bit. And we got, again, he was. A, affable guy who sort of liked what what was going on and everything and so I went in and recorded it again um, with it was, it was with the London Philharmonic Orchestra and uh, uh, that's it, um, and this was much better with more in control I felt I had a conductor who understood more what I was trying to do and stuff it's still moments it went away from me and I couldn't hold it but I think where it worked it really worked well uh, a couple of pieces didn't work um, the final piece, the Spirit of Gravity, the Spirit of Gravity didn't work really very well at all. But by the, I listened to my old demo on that. The the final theme on that ended up being about half speed to what it should be, you know. And at the time, you're sort of so desperate to try and get everything down, you know. Anyhow, so it was that was a bit that was a little disappointing. But some of the other pieces worked well, I think, and uh, encouraged me. So it just encouraged me that once I'd done the one piece. And it came out, and the response was actually surprisingly good. I mean, you know, I got, even from sort of some of the classical people, you know, I mean, it was dismissive from certain areas, which you expected. I expected universal dismissiveness from the classical world, but there were one or two guys out there who actually were quite very positive. And it, you know, it actually sold quite well. Um, obviously, it looks better, because classical music doesn't really sell very much, so, you know, if you sell more than them, suddenly you're in charts and things. And so then the idea of doing a second one came really after we did the Genesis tour, uh, the, the reunion tour. And, you know, I, th I had in the back of my mind, but every time, you know, they say at the end of the thing, what are you going to do next? You know, they'd say to, to Mike and uh, to Phil, and he'd say, oh, and then a solo album. And Mike would say, more Mike and the Mechanics. And I had to say something, so oh, I'll do another classical album. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I did. Um, but this time I wanted to try and control as much as possible, really. So I wanted to get everything together. And I also wanted much more rehearsal time with the orchestra, so I decided to go to Prague to do it over there because, you know, you can get the same amount of work from people about five, four times the work for the same amount of money so I mean I could do a lot of rehearsal with them as it turned out they were so in, much more enthusiastic than the London lot had been and they got really into it and it all happened quite quickly and I was giving them time off you know so <laughs> you've done it you know, don't have to do any more um, and that was a really happy experience for me really and uh, the, the arranger Paul Englishby that I worked with on that, on that was really good and he, he also was the conductor that made it a lot easier so it was a generally very happy experience and I, I was, you know, the result I was in general much happy with too. Gave me a chance to, on that one, I worked, I did, decided to write two pieces for solo instruments with the orchestra as well, which I suppose is a bit more like what I'd done when I was, you know, so back to the days of cinema show and all that. Um, and that was quite fun to do really because you get sort of back cloth going and then you start writing these lines and things and I could do stuff that I could never play. <laughs> um, but I could, with, of course, with the, the version of uh, Blade, which is the, the, the violin piece. But the version I did, my demo, is a, is a lot faster. Um, and it's obviously all done with synthesizer and stuff, so it's, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> I could never play it. <laughs> Fortunately, Charlie it's, you know, he could come close to, close to playing it, um, but not at quite at the speed we had it at. We had to slow it down somewhat. And then, obviously, back to the other player who I'd always wanted to work with, Martin Robertson, who played on, I've known since it was this high, who played on some of my solo albums as well, on other albums. Um, really good sax player. So he ended up doing the other solo part. And so those those are the two from that album that are on this compilation. I think perhaps they're the two, they're the two most direct pieces, mm. if you like. The others are more, slightly more sort of, you know, mood pieces. Do you think some, I, because I, this is the, the impression I get that some people who are maybe fans of Genesis, then sort of discovered more about classical music as a result of, of your um, 
work with with orchestras well hopefully i mean people do i mean i think that sometimes it's a it's a you've got to get over a certain kind of convention you know it's a certain way of hearing music because you hear an orchestra if you're not used to hearing it they all it can all sound the same in a way because it's the same instrumentation and bits and pieces and so once you get inside it um, it's a bit like you know, my parents' attitude to pop music, you know, it all sounds the same, you know, which is what they all used to say, because well, they never got past the loud drums and then the sort of coarse vocals, if you like, you know. Well, once you get inside it, then you start to understand it a bit. And classical music is just the same. And there's so many, I mean, obviously there's wonderful music you know, of, of, of so many different kinds, really. Um, and uh, I think, you know, a lot of it is, is highly melodic, too. So, you know, you might have more difficult with the sort of, well, some of the modern music is more difficult to cope with, but also even some of the classical stuff, which which tends to sort of just sort of do what classical does, a lot of sort of arpeggiating and stuff like that, you know. But when you get the fantastic melodies, I mean, everybody knows so many of these pieces, and sometimes they don't know they know them, whether it's all the planets or whether it be Nimrod from the Algarve, you know, ending with variations, whatever. These kind of pieces are sort of part of everybody's knowledge, even if they don't know it is. And, and people then hear them in context and, and realise that the music around them is fantastic as well, you know. I, I mean, I, I just... The orchestra is a wonderful thing, really, I think. But sometimes I think perhaps classical music does tie itself too much, you know, you kind of... you can, There are all these other sounds out there and it can be done, I think. And I, I've always thought the idea of trying to introduce a few other sounds in there would be quite nice, without making it obviously jazzy or something, which is mm. what some people do, you know. Jazz is something different again. Um, I just think it's you know the world of music. I mean, I, I I'm one of those people. I've got quite Catholic taste, but there's a lot of things I don't like, in a way. Um, but I have quite a lot of things from various areas that I like. Some of which might surprise people, and some of which wouldn't. Um, so I kind of uh, you know back when I was you know 13 or whatever, and the Beatles were first sort of like happening, I kind of liked everything really to some degree. And by the time I got to 17, 18, 19, I I liked virtually nothing. <laughs> I think it's. I think that once you start writing yourself too, you sort of you get a different impression of it. I think it, it, it's and you sort of pop music has a certain limitation in that. I think once you've heard it once, it, there's an awful lot of repetition goes on. An awful lot of what you hear on the radio today is kind of similar to what was happening a long time ago in terms of harmonic structure and and everything, particularly. Um, the, the, perhaps where it's got more inventive is in the rhythm end, which perhaps doesn't interest me quite so much. You know. So I, I don't know. It's a. You know, I admire these people who can still listen to, you know, who are still big fans of pop music. That's great. I think it's great to, to keep that, you know. I think the other thing when you're a writer and you, you, you're doing it all this time, you, you do get a little bit... You analyse, over-analyse stuff, I think, and you get a bit fed up with... You actually hear too much music as well, your own stuff, and and you can't stop yourself. Perhaps a bit of comparison goes on all the time. And you think, well, that's not that good, you know. In fact, you underestimate it. Mm. You know, I think some people are overrated and all the rest of it for no particular reason really other than the fact that they're doing better than you <laughs> <laughs> do you plan to do some more classical uh, projects well certainly so the next project is, is is a classical thing i did it, it was commissioned to do this um orchestral piece for the Cheltenham music festival last year which was quite a interesting experience i mean it was, it was fun to do but quite also quite traumatic in many ways anyhow i'm going to use that piece which is with and i've written two other pieces at the moment that, that go with that and probably will write one or two more, I don't know. I won't write five, because then I don't want to call the next one five. <laughs> Seven, six, five sounds like it's a bit a bit cheesy, really. But um, it may be four. I don't know, really. They're longer pieces. There's certainly two of them are longer, because the piece I wrote for, for Cheltenham was 15 minutes long, and I wrote another one that's about 15 minutes long as well. So it's kind of... I seem to be getting even more long-winded in my old age. The other thing I've actually done recently, which was quite fun, was I wrote this... Um, singer, this classical singer, a guy called John Potter, asked me to write some um, m uh, music to go with these, well, set this, these poems to music, if you like, by a guy called Thomas Campion, who's a sort of ancient poet. I mean, he wrote his, he did write, most of these were songs, he wrote them to music himself, but I didn't listen to any of the original ones, and I, I wrote three pieces for him, two of which he's putting on a record thing that's coming out. And uh, I did them very quickly, which was really nice, actually. I just sort of saw the lyric, as if you like, the, the poem, and I just wrote what came to me with the lyric. And, you know, one of them I wrote really in, you know, ten minutes, and the other one probably only in a, a bit longer. And it was it was quite nice, a bit back to sort of, you know, early days, a little bit. But actually, I've never really written 
anything with lyrics first, it struck me. And I thought, well, that's like, what a great idea. So that's why Elton John finds it so easy, you know? Because you've got a lyric and it sort of does set you in motion. Whereas we've always tended to do Genesis and my own stuff, nearly always written the lyric second. So you're trying to fit a lyric to an existing melody, which is more, more difficult, I think, uh, definitely. Um, so I don't know. So I wouldn't mind doing a bit more of that maybe, but I uh, haven't, you know, not, nothing, nothing's, nothing's sort of happening yet in that area. And, and with a chord too far, mm -hmm. um, it's it's interesting in, in in the way as as you say you've you've re you haven't done this in a chronological order, no. uh, and you've presented um, the music you've let the music stand on on, on its own merits really rather than and and re sequenced it with that in mind. Mm. Um, how on earth did you actually manage to sort of narrow down? Because there is so much music on on these albums. Well, this, you know, it ended up being using quite a lot of the songs. Right, the first three CDs are all from the the sort of rock albums, if you like. You know, they were written after all. There wasn't that long a period. I mean, the first one was written in '78, and the last one was probably written in the '90s, sometimes. I think so. It's you know, it's not like it's a massive period of time. So there, there isn't that problem where you've got sort of different production techniques. We have actually remixed some of the earlier stuff. You know. Be honest, which it helps a bit. Um, so I just looked at it and I just thought, well, how would I put this together if these are all new songs? You know, I tried a few different orders, a few bits and pieces. I so I fancied the idea of starting with this piece from Quicksilver because I felt it wasn't noticed before. And it, where I used it before in in the in the film, it, it led into a version of a shortcut to somewhere. But in this, I lead it into the song at the edge of night, which is one song I sing myself. I also wanted to try, I thought, put me singing early up, so I'm not going to hide behind anything. OK, I'm, I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but here it is, and I think this is a great song. You know, maybe I'm not singing it that well, but it is a good song, so I put that there. And it was, you know, it didn't, just again, to try and emphasise the different song. I mean, that song was sort of on the side too, somewhere on, on, on uh, The Fugitive, and I think it's, you know, perhaps, you know, it's just nice to put it, to put it there. I don't think it's just any better than... Um, the original opening track, This Is Love, but it's just This Is Love had quite a lot of exposure, whereas this doesn't, you know. So it, you do a bit of that, and then you then you go for the soft lad stuff, and you put a bit of this, a couple of instrumental tracks here and there, and, and just see what um, see what works and what doesn't work. Really. And it's funny when you hear a track with, that, with a different track after it, it makes that track sound very different. It, it, it takes, for me, because I mean, obviously I know the, the old albums pretty well, and I expect a certain track to come, and to hear another track sometimes just sets it up differently. I think I think it works quite well, really. And uh, I'll, some people may... I think most people would prefer to hear it like that. I, I'm never sure about the chronological sequence because, you know, you're hearing songs together which have been together before and and also you start to get into some of the same orders as you had before and it comes a little bit to sing, well, I've heard this before, you know. So it's quite fun to do that. The fourth CD, obviously, is one that concentrates more on the uh, orchestral stuff. It includes couple of the demos from um, Wicked Lady plus the main theme from the Wicked Lady plus four songs from six and seven uh, plus one unreleased track which is don't get too excited it's not the best track on the album but it's a little piece I wrote I think it must have been during the still album which never got developed I came back to it that's rather nice actually and I must have written it with the intention of writing lyrics to it because the way it's structured sounds to me like a, a song so if anyone wants to write lyrics for it they're welcome you know it's a, it's a, yeah, I keep it's funny because it's in because it's in sort of sort of three four, I keep expecting Enya to come in. Actually, sort of, it's that kind of <laughs> sound about it. Um, but then the other three pieces, which are the demos for, were recorded for the classical albums. Two of which were were done without really knowing they were going to be for the classical album. Uh, and the third one was done very much with the instrumentation in mind, thinking about how how the final version could sound. So they all feature piano. Um, quite strongly in them actually but they have a certain quality about them I think that is quite nice I mean obviously the, the orchestral version is you know, much richer but I think there's a flow about them I like and also I think it's quite nice to, for people perhaps who like by the time you get that far on side four you're doing alright okay so you must be <laughs> liking something what you're hearing so by this point you might be quite interested to hear how things sort of developed a bit and, uh, and that's what happens and future plans what plans do you have musically for the future? Well, I said just the next thing is the the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not retired after all. I mean, I was going to retire when I was 50, and I'm I'm, still, I'm, I'm now an OAP. <laughs> just 65. That sounds hard. You can't believe it when, when you get there. But anyhow, I am there. Um, I mean, I, I like making music, you know. I, I don't feel any 
and you know one I feel there's some purpose to it and I think doing the the orchestral stuff has given me some purpose in a way you know I really enjoy doing this album as well this compilation thing because I just really like to put it all out there I just think well why not just get it out there because most of the albums are now deleted you know so they're not available and they're going to be available again mm -hmm. soon I know that but um and it just seemed to me nice to do a retrospective on all that because I don't know that I'll ever do any more rock music I sort of feel you know, I don't know that it's in many ways I feel well, if I did another one I don't think I'd do anything that was any better than these ones so and most people have never heard these so why not just put these out and see what happens but in terms of the orchestral stuff I feel I've got further to go with that and you know I'm sort of getting better at it quite a lot to learn in that direction and um, so that's the sort of musical plans but you know I'm open to anything really I mean it, it just you know it's not a I have no compulsion to do it you know, now I really don't I just sort of you know the ambition, if you like, is sort of not there in the way perhaps it was when I was sort of 17, you know. But um, I love music and I love to be able to do it. Well, Tony Banks, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Very much looking forward to the box set coming out. Thank you very Sorry, much. That's good. How's my collar? Oh, <laughs> tough.